Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, the Minister for Science and uh, Universities, uh, David Willits, uh, who essentially is my boss, um, would have been here. Um, but those of you who are still practicing scientists uh, will recognize that um, if I said his first priority today, and I do apologize, it's his first priority, is to defend the science budget in this country, um, that is where he is, and I'm here talking to you. Um, first of all, may I echo the congratulations to Sir Charles for his, his uh, Nobel Prize and for his, his knighthood. Um, it is a, a great achievement, and we're all in awe of, of what you have achieved during your lifetime. Um, I worked with lasers, as some of you will know. I was actually educated as a spectroscopist in Oxford in the 60s, but worked with lasers and laser systems in the 60s and early, early 70s and into the early 80s. Um, and I was rather delighted, given... Uh, um, Dan just mentioned I work in transport, and I've been up to here in volcanic ash, sort of metaphorically speaking, um, for the last couple of months, that we're using LIDARs. We're using laser radars to characterize the ash clouds. Now, that technology was instantly available for characterizing those ash clouds as a result of 40 years' research that had been carried out through a number of establishments, including the one that, that are here today, um, so that... I'll come back to this later, but it does matter that we have continuity of research. And indeed, that for me is one of my first major points, that the general lesson we can learn of continuity of funding to provide excellent research and excellent research outcomes doesn't happen by accident. It happens because scientists believe in making sure that it does happen and collectively reinforce the message with our politicians that you should not prejudice the process of continuous investment in knowledge about science. Sometimes, and Sir Roy Pike, who's sitting here in front of me, and I defended the existence of quantum optics to the defense establishment, who for a long time couldn't see the relevance. Now, with quantum cryptography and quantum computing upon them, they see the relevance. And without that fundamental work that was carried on in the 60s and 70s, we wouldn't be in a really strong position to understand the benefits and possible disbenefits of quantum computing and quantum uh, cryptography. That doesn't mean to say some research shouldn't be strategic and pointed towards applications for the benefit of mankind. And uh, probably we're at a point where we need to think about the rebalancing of that. But one thing we mustn't do is prejudice the way in which we fund our basic knowledge. I was stuck, struck this morning when Professor Towns was talking about research laboratories. Research laboratories are very much the child of the late 30s and during the Second World War. And they were maintained in this country through the 50s and 60s, mainly into the 70s, but not much after that. And they started to come under some duress. And indeed now, you'll find it quite hard to find government-owned research laboratories. There are extremely few. By contrast to the United States, who I think have been incredibly wise in maintaining their state laboratories, their public laboratories, which are state-funded. doesn't mean to say they can't trade with commerce, but they do get a sustained and continuous investment. And one of the big issues for the UK and one of the pieces of advice that we're constructing for David Willits is how do we maintain that feeling of community around research that those research laboratories gave our generation, and I speak for the elderly population in this room, sorry, older population, um, because we, we have benefited hugely. Our, benef our, our benefits have been fantastic from that. Our younger generation are not, gener not having that experience, and we need to find a way of putting that back in a way that's affordable, that delivers appropriate um, research and appropriate benefits for society and for them as individuals. The last point I'd like to make is uh, to echo the point that was made this morning that the laser at one time was seen as a solution looking for a problem. It struck me the other day when I was thinking about what I'd say today that how many words does the word laser now qualify? Altimetry, surgery, communications. I haven't gone through the whole list, but I'm sure you could all individually think of at least seven more, and, and you'd find a long list of activities which are problems which are now at least solved either completely or partially by the use of the laser. And for me, that's one of the things that a really major breakthrough will, will do. It will qualify the way in which problems that are either of economic or social benefit will be qualified. Now, we need a lot more of those. And that's one of the challenges I think we face at the moment is to find breakthroughs that deal with our economic and our environmental problems. I was struck also that the history that we've been talking about this morning, particularly 
uh, by Professor Towns quite rightly using slides, overheads, which I've not used for some years, I guess most people in the room haven't, that the history of this particular part of our human existence is largely still in printed form. It's not retrievable online. Anyone under 20 probably doesn't go to a library very often to read books. They only go there when the web points them to that being the source material. And if we don't have this material, this history, online, the next generation won't find it. And if they don't find it, they'll repeat the mistakes and they won't enjoy the discoveries that we've had over the last half a century. Now, I think there is a challenge, if I may, to the academies represented in the room, both in this country and elsewhere, that we need to get our history accessible so that we can all benefit and the next generation can benefit. Our generation has discovered a significant fraction of what the human race has ever discovered. If we don't pass it on effectively and efficiently to the next generation, we'll have failed them. It happens to be one of David Willits's major activities at the moment is intergenerational equity. I'm glad I didn't have a glass of wine at lunch. <laughs> but nevertheless, this is one element of that which I think is particularly important. So, in closing, could I re-echo my congratulations? It's a real privilege to be here to be able to address you. I do apologize that David Willis couldn't be here. He will be in touch with you personally, I know, because I've told him he must. <laughs> no, seriously, he will. And <laughs> seriously, he will. But we do have a budget next week. Some of you may have noticed. It's a bit preoccupying. So, um, just in closing, thank you all very much for, for, for listening. And again, it's a privilege to be here for both of you. Thank you.